can be no truer line than those lines, Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord has been faithful, and the Lord has shown his wisdom and willingness to do for us, and the Lord has often kept all promises that he ever made, not often, but always, kept all promises he's ever made. That is a certainty. I wanted you to think about what we're going to talk about tonight, and that has to do with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. What was it that Jesus said? To quote one very brief line out of something he said, he told us, I will come again. Might very slightly into the translation, but bottom line, I will come again. One of the places that's found is over in 1 John chapter 14, where Jesus makes the promises of many mansions and, and great dwelling places in his Father's house. But he made it clear of his return. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places, and if it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also." That's just about as clear as it can be. I will come again. And the purpose in mind, the purpose that he states is, I will come again to receive you. That would tell you right there, Jesus is not coming back to establish an earthly kingdom. He's not coming back to have another round down here upon this earth. He's coming back to get those who are faithful to him and take them home with him. Now look with me over in Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 9 at verse 28, it confirms the same concept and same idea. It says that Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he, listen to it now how it states it, he will appear a second time. So when we talk about the second coming of Christ, that's why we say that. He will come a second time. And when he comes the second time, it won't have anything to do with coming back to, to bear our sins or anything like that. That's been done, and it doesn't need to be done anymore. But he will come a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those that are waiting for him. That's identical to what he was saying there in John chapter 14. He's coming back to bring us home, to bring us uh, to bring our salvation so that that uh, a finished thing, and it's not simply salvation in the remission of sins, it's salvation in the sense of we will stand with Him throughout all eternity and be with Him. We, we think also about something else. We, of course, observe the Lord's Supper each first day of the week. We observe the Lord's Supper. Paul said you should observe the Lord's Supper for a particular reason. You should show his death, but remember what he says there now in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. You will show his death. So every Sunday we're up here taking the Lord's Supper, and it says it's going to show about his death until he comes. So that thought is very entrenched in the Scripture, and it's, it's a pretty frequent you know, allusion to the idea that he is coming back, the plan always to come back. Let me, let me just say very briefly about this, that you, you stop and think that from Genesis to, to the time that we read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about Jesus coming, there was a long period of time, and Scripture gradually, more and more, always had been God's plan, but Scripture began to talk about that Jesus would come. And it, you know, it was in prophecy, and some of it was somewhat veiled, but it was pretty clear somebody was coming, they would take away our sins, they would rule, they would have authority from God, and all of that. So you see that promise made over and over again, and then finally, Jesus comes. It, it really, from creation to Jesus' coming, was several thousand years before it unfolded about 4,000 years at least of recorded Bible history. Yet God fulfilled that promise. And God kept that promise. Jesus came and it happened as, as was planned. So when Jesus tells us while he's upon this earth, I will come again, and explains to us why he's coming back, it's a fact to be believed. I mean, just as surely as Jesus came the first time, Jesus is coming again. So we want to look at that 
some more of this evening. Let's talk about that a moment. In Matthew chapter 24, look with you a few things over there. In Matthew 24, Jesus really stunned his disciples because they have been talking about the beauty of the temple as it was back then. It was a massive, huge undertaking. Herod the Great had built, and, and it is still under construction, even in Jesus' time, various parts of it were st still being built. But he stunned his disciples as they commented on the beauty and glory of the temple. He stunned them by saying that there will not be one stone left upon another. That it was going to be destroyed, that temple would be destroyed. And there was an intense discussion about that in Matthew chapter 24. And, and they crossed over and they went over to the Mount of Olives. And you kind of have to envision, sitting on the Mount of Olives, you have this wonderful panoramic view of Jerusalem. And as you look out over all of that, you're looking over at the temple area and you can see it all spread out as it, as it was up against the Kidron Valley that lay in between there in the Mount of Olives. And the disciples started asking Jesus about when that would happen. And, and that led to great discussion. And so Jesus had that discussion with them. And he went on in that text. And I'm kind of setting this up. But he went on in that text to describe various signs that would show them about when that would happen. That's what they were asking him. When is the temple going to be destroyed? And, and how is all that going to come to pass? Jesus described very certain things that would show them, signs, if you will, that would point them to the time when the temple would be destroyed. And this is very interesting and very elaborate, and I'm not trying to get into all of that this evening, but it's, it's a really worthwhile study to, to be guided in sometime. But to show you something about this context, in verse 35, as Jesus is talking about this, and I need to add in one other fact. They ask, when will these things be, and what are going to be the signs of this? But they ask one other question, and I don't know why they ask this question. Maybe in their minds they associated it with that destruction. But they said, what will be the sign of your coming? Okay? So when will these things be? When, when is all this going to happen? How will we know it's going to happen? But they ask another question, what will be the sign of your coming? And Jesus tells them at verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away. Okay? That's a marker in this text. Heaven and earth is going to pass away. My word will not pass away, but heaven and earth will pass away. Perhaps that's more related to the signs of Jesus' coming. Now remember I said in regard to Jerusalem, he gave them all kind of signs. If you, especially if you take Matthew and Luke's account, it's real interesting because Jesus really laid it out for him. He, they explained exactly what would go on and how bad it would be and how the Roman armies would invade and surround their city and all of that. And, and Jesus even told them, now when you see this, you need to get out of the city. When you see this sign, by the way, all this unfolded in 70 AD, he said, when you see this, you, you, you've got to escape, and you've got to go then. Don't delay. But then at verse 35, he says, now heaven and earth will pass away. Now here's something interesting. Heaven and earth will pass away, and then Jesus said, but of that day and of that hour, Nobody knows. What did they ask? They'd ask, well, what about when is this going to happen? What signs will be shown? Jesus said, okay, here's your signs of when Jerusalem will be destroyed. But when he gets to talking about heaven and earth passing away, he said, of that day and hour, nobody knows. Nobody knows. Not the angels. Jesus would say, not even me but my Father in heaven. And the bottom line is Jesus will start a whole new discourse in Matthew 24 going into Matthew 25 and he will say, now look, when we start talking about me coming back, not just the destruction of Jerusalem, but me coming back, there's not any signs. Jerusalem, 
There will be signs. I'm telling you what to look for, when to flee. But of that day and hour, when we're talking about heaven and earth passing away, there are no signs. And listen to some of the things that Jesus says at verse 42, for instance. He says, watch therefore, you don't know what hour your Lord is coming. You see, you, you start a definite departure, and sometimes people get all of this mixed up as they study Matthew 24, but you have a series of signs explaining the destruction of Jerusalem, which took place in 70 A.D., but when you start talking about the real coming of the Lord, the final coming of the Lord, when heaven and earth will pass away, there's not going to be a sign for that. And everything Jesus says after that is, you're going to have to watch. You're going to have to be aware, for you don't know what hour the Son of Man is coming. Look at verse 44. He says, the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you don't expect. You know, a lot of people start talking about signs of the times and what will point us when Jesus says, but if you listen to this language, he's saying, but I'm not offering you a sign. I'm not telling you a sign to look for. There is no sign that I can point you to to that time. Matter of fact, again, Jesus said the angels don't know this time. Jesus said, I don't know. It's all in my Father's hands at the hour he's saying. But you don't know what hour the Son of Man is coming. Well, With that in mind, we have to stop and think some things that Jesus says here. He says it's going to be like the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, how were things? How did things happen when God sent the flood? In the days of Noah, before the flood, what were they doing? They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. What would that tell you? If you sat down and ate and drank, worked and you know went about your normal routine, or would you schedule a wedding for you or your child or anybody in your family? Would you schedule a wedding on the day the flood was coming? No, of course not. Well, why? They don't know that it's coming. It's not maybe that Noah hadn't announced it. They didn't believe it, so they don't know it's coming. They don't have any idea it's about to happen. And so until that very day, they were eating and drinking in marriage, and giving in marriage. Let me tell you something. I feel very assured that on the day Jesus comes back, people will be eating and drinking and there will be weddings and everything will be like normal. They'll be going to work, they'll be caring about their business. It'll be an identical type day. And that's what he's trying to say here. But he says, they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. And that's what the coming of the Son of Man will be. So we have the absolute assurance of Jesus that you're not going to know this time. The world will not know this time. There is no indicator of this time period when he's coming. Another example that Jesus gives us, and this occurs in Luke, 20, in Luke chapter 17, he says it was the same thing that happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planning, they were building. Listen to all those activities. Everything was normal. Nobody was getting on mountaintops saying Solomon and Gomorrah is about to be destroyed. Nobody's making a big plan here. Nobody's worried about the destruction. They don't know that it's coming. They're not aware of it. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven. It destroyed them all. It destroyed them all. And he said it will be just the same on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Pretty clear information. Here's another familiar uh, scripture concept. Here's what he says in Matthew 24 verse 43. He says, well you know this, that if you're in your home, if the master of the home had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched. Makes total sense, doesn't it? If he knew when the thief was coming, he would have watched. And he would have not allowed his house to be broken into. Natalie was telling us about a scary event in their neighborhood the other night, and that was once she heard through the grapevine about it, but anyway said that a man got a phone call in his house in the middle of the night from his security company and said, your door has been breached and somebody's in your house. That's not news you want to hear at two in the morning, is it? He got up as he walked through the house. There was the man standing in the middle of his house had broken in. 
there was a momentary kind of a confrontation and the man fled, thanks goodness. But you know, the bottom line is if you'd known the hour when you sort of made plans about that, if you'd known the hour you'd been working on that, you'd have double bolted your door, you'd have watched for every window, you would have sat up with probably your gun in hand and prepared for him and he'd said that's what would happen and he said that's what we have to envision the coming of Christ as. And he said, therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you don't expect. Now we're going to talk about at the end of the lesson about getting ready, but you do understand the thief, the thief in the night concept from being promoted here and how significant that is. He goes on with that same thought. I think it's interesting that, that Paul used the same expression in 1 Thessalonians when talking about the coming of the Lord. He says, you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Why, did, why could Paul say that? Because they'd all studied it. They knew Jesus had said that. The Lord's coming like a thief in the night. So Paul says, everybody knows that. And when people are out there saying peace and safety, we will find destruction will come upon them like labor pains upon a woman with child, and, and they will not escape. So what we understand is that the second coming will be like that. And here's another illustration. Here's a house full of servants. Their master goes away on a trip. He takes a trip out of town, maybe a little extended journey. They don't know exactly when he's coming home. Well, Jesus says, well, my coming will be like be like a, a master returning home. And he kind of comes back suddenly before they really would expect him to be back. And of course the whole point as Jesus expresses this, and by the way, that, that's all in the latter part of Matthew 24. One of the things he says, the servants should have expected their master. You say, well, if you don't know when he's coming, you, you don't know that he's coming today. Well, exactly, but the point being, you don't know, so what do you have to do to get ready? This is the whole theme behind all of these points. And Jesus then answers, well, what do we have to do to get ready? He says, who is a faithful and wise servant? If you know he's coming back, but you don't know when he's coming back, then if you're wise and you're faithful to your master, and you know that he gave you responsibilities over his household to feed them and take care of his household, then the best you can do is know, I'm doing what he asked me to do while he's away. See, he didn't, he didn't ask anybody to get on a mountaintop, did he? He didn't ask anybody to go out, now you go out and sell everything you got, and, and you do stay prep and all of that. He didn't ask anybody to do that. He says, you go on about your business doing what I ask you to do. And that's how you get ready. That's how you are prepared. And it's really a spiritual danger he brings up in this text. It's a spiritual danger for any of us as Christians to sit back and say, why, well, that's probably going to happen anytime soon. To ever say in our hearts or minds, well, my master is delaying, he probably... So, the, you know, the, the counterpart of that, as Jesus explains the parable, you and I would be very foolish indeed to wake up in a day and say, well, I don't... I don't think Jesus would come today. You know, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Well, how do you know that? You know, we have religious friends and neighbors who make a big deal about the coming of the Lord, but they believe 101 signs are going to be done. It'll be so obvious by the time he gets here, nearly everybody will know. It's not that way. You've read the information. The information said, I'm not giving you any signs, and there's nothing to point it out. With that in mind, you and I can't ever afford a day where we would think any more than this might be the day my master comes back. And so he says, don't think your master is delaying his coming. You can't afford to think that way. Look a little bit further. He says, the master of that servant will come on that day when he is not looking for him at an hour that he's not aware of. And he will cut him in two, and he will appoint his portion with the hypocrites. And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's a frightening scripture. 
What a terrible thing to not be prepared on that day for the coming of the Lord and to know that that might happen. Furthermore, let's add in what Mark says in Mark 13, 35, be on the alert. You don't know when the master is coming, whether it's evening or midnight or the, when the rooster crows or in the morning. You just don't know. Not only do we not know when the day is, you don't know what time of day it could be. It could be any point in that day. And of course, logically, in the world out there, it's going to be different times for different people, different hours of the day. As the earth, there's different time zones and all of that. But he said, you don't know about those kind of things. And so he says again in Mark 13, take heed, watch and pray. You don't know what time he is coming. Jesus told in Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 through 13, I'm going to read that, it won't be on the screen, those particular scriptures, but he told the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. Let's just read that together. If you've got your Bible and want to open it to that or just listen as I read, here's what it says. The kingdom of heaven will be compared to ten virgins who took their lamps. They went out to meet the bridegroom. Now this is kind of based on their customs. He said five of them were foolish and five of them were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they didn't take any extra oil with them. They had the oil on the lamp, but they didn't bring extra. What would that indicate? It would mean they didn't think they'd be there all that long. It's not going to be a big wait. He's come, he'll come soon. The prudent, though, they took oil and flask along with their lamps. So they had a refill to use if need be. All right? He says, now when the bridegroom was delaying, well, they all got drowsy and they began to sleep. That kind of sounds like me, as Carolyn would tell you. Fall asleep pretty quick waiting on all of that. But then all of a sudden, at midnight, there was a shout. Again, this having to do with their customs. And what they would do is they would walk from their fathers, the bridegroom would come from his father's house and lead a procession through the streets. It could be any time. He would come and it says that they said, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all of those virgins arose and they had trimmed their lamps, which means they'd done some things to get ready. But the prudent, I'm sorry, the, uh, the foolish said to the prudent, uh, our lamps are going out. Can, can you give us some of your oil? Our lamps are running out. We left them going because we were waiting and, and we didn't get any extra because we thought it was going to be pretty soon. And, and the prudent says, no, there will not be enough for us and for you too. You're going to have to go to the dealers and you're going to have to buy some for yourselves. Not a very good time of night in days before Walmart to be able to have to go get your extra oil. So it says, the prudent said, but there will not be enough for us and you. Uh, <clears throat> so they went to get the extra oil, and they were on their way to make the purchase when the bridegroom came. Now you've got to keep in mind, this is a good story. It illustrates well, and you get vividly in your mind, you're picturing all this happening, and you think about going, having to go out and buy your extra oil and all of that, and kind of the crisis, and you're, you, you know he's about to come, and yet you're not prepared. But while they were there, it says the bridegroom came. And, and the ones that were ready went on in with him to the wedding feast. But at that point, a door was shut. And later... The other virgins also came and they said, Lord, Lord, open up to us. And he said, truly I say unto you, I, will not, I do not know you. So why would Jesus tell this story? He says, well, you have to be on the alert. You have to be on the alert because you don't know the day or the hour. No one knows about this day. Maybe everything in the... In the story, it doesn't make a perfect corresponding, but you kind of got to stop and think. We have to be prepared, don't we? The very thing that he's trying to get at is, is be prepared. So as we think about when the bridegroom came, it was too late to make preparations. This story answers something in my book, and one of the things it answers is, well, why, when, when I start seeing the Lord coming, surely, you know, I'd, I'd have enough time to drop to my feet and tell the Lord, I'm so sorry for all my sins and I, I wish I hadn't done all of those things and 
I'll just get everything straightened out at that moment and wait until then. And I would think that story would pretty well answer that for us, wouldn't it? And it would say, yeah, but you should have already made your preparations. It's too late to make those changes now. So watch. The lesson is watch. You don't know the day or the hour the Lord is coming. All right, I'm going to spend just a few more minutes with you talking about what the Scripture says. And we've already heard some of these things, but I didn't play them up as much. Things we have to do to be prepared. Uh, you, will, you will notice one of the answers is not. We'll study all the prophecies so you'll know exactly when it's going to happen. I'm sorry, but that won't do you any good. Uh, it's not going to tell you when it's going to happen, and every guess anybody's ever made has been wrong so far. So don't look for that on the list. Here are some things we know about. And I'm just giving you the word out of this because many of these we've already read. You have to watch. You have to watch. I say to you all, watch. What does he mean by that? Because you can't stand around on your rooftop looking all day long. How do you watch for the coming of the Lord? I think you do it by doing what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. You're looking for and you're hastening the coming of the day of God. You're anticipating that. You're watchful in the sense that you know this could be the day. You understand this could be the time. Don't, don't say someday. We all know it's coming someday, but it could be today and I need to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Here's another word that's brought up, is to wait. Not just everybody's got to wait anyway, but the idea is we are waiting, we, we are anticipating, like you... You know, like, kind of like you know companies coming, you maybe don't know what time they're getting there, but out-of-town guests, maybe they're coming. So you're waiting. And, and you don't go somewhere else and leave the house, you know, because you know they're coming. So you're waiting. It says in Philippians 3.20, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I just I want to be real fair with this text, and I don't want to impose on it more than what it says, and I also don't want to plant on you some like horrific guilt trip, but I want to be real honest with you about this. The word eagerly in that passage sticks out to me, and that we're eagerly awaiting. Like this is going to be a good thing, not just a scary thing, but a good thing, that we're eager for Him to come. We're glad for Him to come and we're happy that He's coming. And that that's part of our anticipation even though we don't know exactly when it will take place. We are told, among other things, we have to take heed. Look at, look at this. Now, that's where it's said, but here's a complimentary passage to that. Take heed to yourselves. And I thought this was an especially interesting passage. Here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to be out there when the Lord comes back carousing. You know what carousing is? It's, it's out running around, drinking, partying, you know, doing things you ought not to do. You're out there carousing and the Lord comes back. You don't want to be drunken and the Lord comes back. But you also don't want to be weighed down with all the cares of life. That could include worry. You don't want to be caught up in whatever's wrong right now and there's always something wrong and sometimes there's a lot of wrong and sometimes there's you know, it's a little easier day. But you don't want to be so weighted down as he puts it with the cares of this life and seeing to this and seeing to that and goodness knows there are things that have to be seen to but you don't want to do that to the point to where you're not taking heed so that that day would come upon you and you really just wouldn't be ready for it. These kind of things, I, I think that's especially impressive. And that you probably could add ten more, maybe a hundred more things to his list there. But listen to what he's telling you. There are things that weight you down. You know what they are for you. It's not all just sin. He said cares of this life sometimes. They're things that start weighting you down and they turn your attention away from God onto this world. 
And you know as well as I do, whether you, no matter where you work or whatever, I mean, you can't be thinking about God 24 hours a day. You sometimes are doing a job and working and accomplishing things. But some things weight us down to the point where we kind of forget who we are and what we are and why we're doing what we're doing. And these things weight us down. And it might be sinful things, but it might just be everyday cares of life. And they just kind of make us forget about what's important here. And he said, you don't want to be in that situation when Jesus comes back. We've got to keep a connection with the Lord and we've got to keep a connection with the potential for His coming. He says, one of the ways you do that is sobriety and alertness. That's sort of the opposite of drunkenness if you think about it, but also, he says, you're not in darkness like the world is out there. And so, when he says the day of the Lord's like a thief in the night, he says in one sense for you, even though you don't know the day or the hour any more than anybody else, he said, even though that's so, that day doesn't have to overtake you like a thief. Your children, your sons of the light, your sons of the daytime, you're not a darkness person, you're a light person. So he says we're not of the night, we're not of the darkness, And we don't sleep. He's talking about spiritually. We don't go to sleep spiritually like other people do. We don't lose consciousness to where we're not thinking about what we're doing. We physically sleep like others do, but we don't spiritually sleep so that we're not paying attention like others do. We instead as Christians are striving to be alert and sober to the realities of this. Now, just about this point in the lesson, I just have to drive home a point again. I'm not talking fairy tale stuff. I'm not talking, you know, I wonder if this is really going to happen. I'm saying that just as sure as a Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, came down here the first time, lived, died on the cross, resurrected, and went back to heaven, just as sure as that's a moment in earthly history, there will be this moment in earthly history. It's a reality. And if that's so, you can't treat it like, you know, like I say, fairy tale type stuff. Another thing that Jesus brings up is that a way to be prepared for all of this is to just perpetually, as Jesus John brings up, perpetually abide in Him. Little children, abide in Him so that when He appears... We won't be ashamed when He comes. We will have confidence. In other words, we will be glad that He's coming and it won't catch us off guard because we have stayed in Him. And that may be a little hard to define sometime. But look at your life every day and be honest with yourself. And maybe that's a little test to always be given to yourself. Have today, have I been abiding in Him? Do I feel like I'm in Christ and and, and does the Scripture pretty much, you know, I'm not perfect, but does the Scripture bear witness that I love the Lord and I'm trying to be faithful to Him and, and, uh, you know, I I worship the Lord and I, I consider His wisdom and will and He's a part of my life and I'm not out here, you know, in drunkenness and carousing and I'm not out here, you know, doing ungodly things and and I'm striving to do what's right. Is that the person that I am? Abide in Him. I I think part of this too. You know, it's abiding in this. It's abiding in His Word. It's staying with it and not leaving it. These are the kind of things we need to do. I I think this is, is an appropriate connection passage in Jude 21. It's the same concept of abiding. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God. And wait on that mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ because that's going to lead to your eternal life. Wait. Um, In the book of James, he talks about James 5, verse 7. Be patient. Be patient. Don't give up. Don't don't in your mind say, well, I, I don't know. I know what sometimes comes across my mind because I don't make predictions and I don't say, You know, I know exactly when it's going to happen. And that is, I face a reality. Man alive, this thing could be a thousand years from now, and I don't know. Jesus may not come back for hundreds of years. 
Why do I have to worry about it right now? You can't afford that attitude. Be patient. I get the impression from New Testament writers, and if you read a little bit of the information after even the first century, Christians wrote like they thought the Lord was coming back any minute. You know why I think they wrote that way? I think because they thought that's how you have to think. You can't afford another way of thinking. You don't want to make false predictions and you don't want to tell people, I know it's going to happen in November of this year or predict a year when it's coming. Don't be foolish because Jesus made it clear. But you can't afford this spirit that says, probably not going to happen for a long time. That corresponds to what Jesus said, oh, my master's probably delaying. Be patient. Stay with it, he's saying. Here's another thought. During this time, use your days to live soberly, righteously, and godly. Deny ungodliness. Deny worldly lust. Live those ways soberly, righteously, godly. A trio and a, a triune thought about what we need to be in this present age, this world we live in. While we are looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Another thing we're told we need to do to get ready is to pray. In Luke 13, 33, we read it earlier, but it said, take heed, watch and pray. You don't know when the time is. Watch and pray. A duo of thoughts there. Watch and pray. What should we be doing? We should be doing the Lord's business. Luke chapter 19, verse 13. He calls his ten slaves. This is a parable again. Like, kind of like the parable of the talents. He called his ten slaves. He gave them ten minas, and he said to them, now you do business till I come back. <laughs> you don't typically think of doing for the Lord as doing business, but it's doing his business. We've got things to be doing. By the way, you know, and it, it mentions in, in, uh, in, Thessalon in Thessalonians, it talks about people who said, thought, well, the Lord's about to come. I'll quit my job. No point in working and doing all of that. Why should I do that? I'll just eat off of people until the Lord comes. He says, that's, that's idle and it's wrong and it's ungodly. And he actually told the church, you discipline them if they won't repent. That's not the way for a Christian to be. We have a job to do. We have work to do. We, we have the business of our families and we have other things that we need to be doing so we don't need to be lazy about anything. And we've got the Lord's business to be doing. But here's the thought, and again, this does not just rip you apart. I'm just trying to get in our hearts and think. I'm going to be someday, if I live during this moment, which could happen, we all know and we've all seen. So how, I would need to ask myself, Every day, have I taken care of the Lord's business? He had things He asked me to do. We talked about pray. Uh, other responsibilities that we have. You know, that would be one thing. And I, you know, I'm not your judge and everything for sure. But that would be one thing. If you you'd just get real heart with me here for a moment, Okay. That would be one reason I would never want to miss the Lord's Day. Barring sickness or something like that, I don't want to miss the Lord's Day because that would be job one in my book of doing the Lord's business. Not the only thing for sure, don't misunderstand me, but I don't want to be having messed around and not observe the Lord's Day and not observe the Lord's Supper because I was too busy with my own business. That's not what I want if the Lord comes back. And we have to, as I said, think this way. One other thing that we might think about is that we are to encourage one another in this regard to, to tell each other these things. First Thessalonians tells about the coming of the Lord. And it says, you know, at that time we who are alive and are left until that coming will not precede those who have fallen asleep. He's talking about the order of the, the resurrection. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and the, the, the sound of the trumpet of God will sound. And then the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, 
and so we'll always be with the Lord. Well, he follows that by one other thought, and that is, he said, now, everybody go comfort each other with these words. Everybody tell that to each other. The Lord is coming back. The Lord is returning. There's a quick list for you right up there of all that we've said, not with the verses this time, with all that we've said, things we have to do to get ready. To watch, to be patient, to take heed, to wait, to live soberly, righteously, and godly, to stay abiding in Him, to pray, and to do the Lord's business until He comes. And in the meanwhile, we'll keep trying to be of encouragement to each other about these things. Let me close with one last thought, and the lesson's yours. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, that's the last chapter of 1 Corinthians. And Paul is right near the last couple of last verses there in that text. And when you get down there, now your, verse, your version may translate it. The King James Version did not. And I'm kind of glad it didn't. A couple of others don't either. In those closing remarks, Paul inserts a word. And the word is Maranatha. Maranatha. When you think, what in the world does that mean? Well, it, it turns out that the word, and it may be a play on words, if you will, but the word, and, and I just double-checked it, I believed in my mind it meant this, but I went over there and I, as I studied and I was looking at that, and it, it's a two-part word, really. It's even broken up in the, in the text. And it means, our Lord comes. Our Lord comes. Maranatha, our Lord comes. Something they might have said repeatedly, reminding each other, our Lord comes. And this is the verse where it occurs. It says, you know, if anybody, here's Paul writing now there the end. He said, if anybody doesn't love the Lord, let him be anathema. And then he follows it by that word. And if you sound out those words, it kind of sounds alike. They're not the same, but they have a rhythm and a rhyme to them. Anathema, maranatha. And what he has just said is, if you don't love the Lord, do you realize you are accursed? If you don't love the Lord, do you realize you're under condemnation in the sight of God this hour? If any man doesn't love the Lord, he's in bad trouble with God. Instead, what the Spirit should say of a person is, Maranatha. And why should we say that? We should say to ourselves, you know what, our Lord cometh. Our Lord is coming. And I say to you tonight, this week and throughout our lives, let's love the Lord and let's utter in our hearts and minds, Maranatha, our Lord's coming. And we need to remember it, appreciate it, and know what it requires of us. You've been good to listen to me. Thank you. While we are singing a song of encouragement, imagine the Lord comes and comes at this moment, how would your souls stand be before God? Where would you be in God's sight? Would you be right or wrong? Would you be lost or saved? You can't just say it on your own accord. You've got to say it as the Lord would express it. You've got to be honest with your God. And here's the, here's the truth. If you're not ready, the only way I know is for you to get ready. Come be restored. Come, come be baptized into Christ and, and be in a saved and safe situation before the Lord. We'll sing the song together, and if you need to make a step forward, you come and, and contemplate this, and think about it this week. Our Lord comes. And Jesus, remember in your heart and mind those words, I will come again. It's a promise, and it's a sure promise. Let's stand at this time and sing together.